now. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Ready for a Bible class? I think I am. I need to move this just a little bit more. As usual, my uh, my centering is off. Not my fault. Somebody else's fault. You know that. Hey, we're going to talk today about um, uh, changing over from where we've been in past weeks. We're going to be talking today about God's word in light of our activity. That is, we're going to talk about laboring for the Lord. Um, this may be a long Bible class. It may be a short one. As most of you know, the next three weeks, the next three Sundays, there probably will not be a five o'clock Bible class. Uh, next Sunday is... Um, the uh, 15th, 22nd, and the 29th, and then the 6th of October, we will not be able to have a Bible class. And uh, so it'd be four weeks, I'm sorry, I said three, four weeks before we have another Bible class. Um, uh, October would be October the 13th. And uh, I apologize for it being that long, but the way it's scheduled and the way a Bible conference comes in right at the end of it, it's very going to, not going to be possible for me to do that, probably. Pretty sure I won't. If I do, I'll just announce it at the last minute. <laughs> um, but anyway, I want to talk to you today about laboring for the Lord. Look, if you will, in Ephesians chapter 2. And there's a fundamental right and a fundamental purpose in everything that God does. The right that God has is he is sovereign. He has caused the word in the person of his son as his son and obviously God manifest in the flesh to cause this book to be written. They caused men to write down, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit caused men to write down the words they wanted to describe what they wanted done. Now, the reason I say it like that is because I believe, I believe the King James Bible has English words to describe for us what we should do in light of who God the Father is, what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us, and the benefit of the help and, and protection, if you will, of the Holy Spirit. Now, I believe in doing that. If I hadn't believed in doing that, I wouldn't have spent the last 50 years doing it. But my point about all this is, that according to Ephesians 1 and 2 and 3, we are a special group of people. Now, I don't mean we're good or better than any other spe uh, group of people who are all spe special to the Lord. You know, we learn so much from seeing what we call the Old Testament, Genesis through, Mal uh, through Malachi. And we learn so much about the Lord and his activity and his will, his wish and so forth for his people in that situation. We learn gobs of things. We learn an awful lot of what the Lord wants us to do, how he wants us to do, where he wants us to do it, and so on and so forth. Now, because the Apostle Paul tells us to, we call those time frames, those issues of the Lord to mankind, we call them dispensations. The dispensation of the fullness of times is mentioned in Ephesians chapter 1, which has a strong implication that it does not leave any time left to not be full. It, the terminology says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he, that's God, might gather together in one all things in Christ. Well, now I know what's happened up until uh, our dispensation arrives because I've got history on it. I've got, as we put on the board, and let me just do this again. I, I realize that a lot of this just sounds like repetition, and I apologize if it just sounds boring to you, but it's not boring. It's Jerry that's boring, not this, not this good news. From Genesis to Malachi, that is referred to as the Old Testament. Now, there are divisions in the Old Testament, how God deals with mankind and how God changes why, how he deals with mankind. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of 
people that they, they sort of subscribe to the idea that because seven is a perfect number, there must be seven dispensations. If you treat a dispensation of time as a manner in which God is dispensing his will to mankind, then you will come up with more than, than seven dispensations. You may come up with as many as 14 because it's easy to see how God changes. He doesn't change who he is nor his character. He changes the manner in which he deals with his creation. From Genesis 1 to 3, it was the Garden of Eden. They were driven out of the Garden of Eden, and from 3 to 9, it is the time of Noah. From 9 to to 11, men began to call upon the name of the Lord and did what they thought was right with a minimum of rules and laws about murders, one of them, and so on and so forth. But then from 12, from 12, way on over here, all of that is one dispensation. Starts with Abraham. And of course, Abraham was a very, very rich man by, by the will of God. And when Abraham saw the will of God in, in, um, in uh, vision form, he saw that his descendants, his seed, would go into Egypt and be there for 430 years. Well, that's a long time. So from Abraham to the bringing of the law of Moses turns out to be I think it's going to be about 490 years total. Now, the point about that is, what does that mean? Oh, God is not dealing with the world like he dealt with the world through Abraham's covenant because now he has added the covenant of the law, made a covenant with Moses and the people of Israel who came from Egypt. He made a covenant with them about the law. And so this goes on with Judges. I'll just put a big J-U-D right there, Judges. But then they wanted something different, and it became a kingdom. Now, if you think of a land ruled by judges and a land ruled by kingdom, uh, by a king, the same thing, then you, you're looking the wrong way at America. Now, here's my point. All of that's one time frame from Genesis to Malachi in your Bible, but there are many different ways that God deals with his creation. Now, I know that Abraham's special and was a special man. I know that in the middle of, of the, of the um, rebellion of, heaven, of the, have them having a kingdom, David appears. And when David was here, God dealt with David differently than he did other people. And if you think he didn't, you better reread David's story. Now, when the, when the kingdom went bad, and it did go bad, there is a period of time where there is like, there's no voice from God here. God didn't say anything right here for what, what everybody calls 400 years. It's probably about 470 years, but nevertheless, and then Christ came. Genesis to Malachi is over with, and Christ shows up. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ is the virgin-born son of Almighty God, and there can be no, no real question about that in anyone's mind who believes that Jesus Christ is capable of being your Savior. And he is. He will be. And on and on. But Christ came... To the, to the earth, and I'm, I'm going to do it like this because I know that he, he was born of God. He came down here, and he worked and lived here and worked, uh, did the work of the Lord. I must work the work of my father, he said, and basically 33 years, and that's an arguable point, but nevertheless, there's no point in arguing about it. So there's Christ for 33 years. Well, who did he talk to? He talked to these people. He talked to the descendants of these people. But in particular, when, when, there were, when there were judges, they were coming out of the Levites, the, the tribe of Levi, because they were chosen to be the priest when the nation fell as priesthood. And so Jesus Christ <clears throat> dealt with them. 
If you think I'm wrong about that, you go back and reread Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in particular Matthew. Because it's easy to see in Matthew that what Jesus Christ was doing here on earth was choosing a new priesthood to take the place of the one that was so desperately wrong in their doings. And so in comes, and out of these 33 years comes 12 men. 12 men. And they started a thing because Jesus taught them to. They started a thing that is based upon the cross. Christ died, was buried, was raised again, and then ascended up to the Father and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, the right hand of, of his majesty. And now here's the thing. When he did that, these 12 men received the Holy Spirit. People say, oh, no, it was more than that. No, it wasn't, not to start with. People thinking that the whole crowd of uh, the followers were filled with the Holy Spirit in, in uh, Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, they haven't read it. I t said a while ago, I believe the King James Bible is God's choice of the words that it takes for us to see his will. So then if I go back to see what these 12 men learned, then I go back to the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And when I do that, I see Jesus constantly talking to the 12 apostles. Constantly. Oh yeah, he talked to the masses because he wanted the masses to know of him. But he, he said one, in, in, in one place, he said, many are called, but few are chosen. When he's crucified, buried, and resurrected, he didn't choose a massive bunch of people to go out and listen to him teach the 12 apostles. He took the 12 apostles and taught them. And you see that in, in Acts chapter 1, verse 1, 2, 3, and 4. And they asked him a question. In, in Acts chapter 1, King James Bible, the 12 apostles asked the Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Now, I want you to think about that. That's this one right here where David was a king. It was a kingdom for a thousand years. And that, that kingdom was in a, dis, a destructive mode. It belonged to, primarily it belonged to, to Rome when Christ was here. And it was not being run as a kingdom of God, of a, as a kingdom that God would have anything to do with. And the Levites were just making it up as they went along. So my point there is, when that occurred, the 12 apostles knew something that Jesus had taught them out of the books in Genesis to Malachi. The Bible says in the book of Luke chapter 24 that Jesus taught the 12 the Old Testament scriptures. Well, one of the things that was back there is a whole list of prophets. And I'll start with Isaiah and I'll go, I'll go all the way to Malachi as the prophets. And I forget just what the exact number of them is, but it's Isaiah, Jeremiah, who wrote two books, Ezekiel, then it's Daniel, Hosea, Joel, and on down through those smaller books. But every one of them talked about this coming, Jesus Christ, and the restoration of Israel. Well, now, the restoration of Israel has not yet occurred. So there is a restoration time in which Jesus Christ is going to sit on a throne and rule over the nations, and Israel is going to be in their land. Now, I haven't got time to do this tonight, but if you want, we can study the promises of Israel to the land, and it'll be 85 times that, G that the Bible tells them, that Scripture tells them, that they are one day going to be in that land that God gave to Abraham, and they're going to be in that land forever. It says that whether anybody likes it or not, 85 times. I think you ought to give it to them since God said it 85 times, don't you? That'd be a good thing to do. Let them have it. Well, we can't get to that yet. 
I mean, look at it. Does that Israel that's over there now look like the one that Abraham received this land grant from God and the 12 apostles, I mean, the 12 tribes of Israel went in and possessed and threw out all the bad people and kept that land for themselves when Moses turned it over to Joshua and they walked across the Jordan River and on and on it goes and they took that land and they set up their, their tribes on in, in pockets of land and, and named them according to the, to the 12 uh, sons of Jacob and so on and so forth. Does it look like that today? No. Well, is it going to over there? Yeah, sure is. How do you know? I know by all these books right here between Isaiah and Malachi. The prophecy books. Now, here's the thing. All I'm talking about right there is dispensations. All of this which occurred from Genesis to Malachi, whether you call it one, two, three, four, or ten dispensations, I don't care how many you call it. It's the way God dealt with his creation. The Apostle Paul began to write things over here, and he wrote the books of Romans through Philemon. Now, I know that many of you think this is Jerry's gone back to square one. I sure have, because it never gets tired of seeing how the Lord brought this about. We can see how the Lord brought, a, brought about creation. We can see how the Lord brought about the Garden of Eden and then why he had to get rid of them in the Garden of Eden. We can see what happened to bring us up to Noah's flood. We can see what happened between Noah and Abraham. Then we can see what happened with Abraham and, and Isaac and Jacob and all the way into the kingdom and Moses and then into the kingdom and seeing David as the, a man after God's own heart, a man whose throne will never end And then we can see it in resurrection. We can see when it's, it's gone here. The 12 said, would thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And the Lord never said, yep. The Lord Jesus answered them and said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath placed in his own power, but kept in his own power. Jesus didn't tell them when it was going to occur. And it has never occurred. He said, but you, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And lo and behold, seven days later, boom, they had it. They had that power. They spoke and the words of God came out. They spoke and the people understood them on the basis of their own language. I don't know how many languages were there. I know that about 15 are named. But there's only 12 men speaking tongues. Twelve men spoke and all the people heard in their own language. Wow. That's pretty miraculous. I'd say the next thing you see in the Bible is that John and Peter walk into the temple, see a lame man, and Peter uh, orders him to rise up and walk. He said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee. Pick up thy bed and walk, or whatever, whatever how that he finished it, in the name of Jesus Christ. And then you see the, the warning that Jesus gave to them about speaking against the Holy Spirit. So here's the Holy Spirit come down on those 12 men. And then in chapter 4, there's 3,000 or 5,000 or put together and make it 8,000. I don't care how many people you do this. But all of a sudden, in a room where they were all meeting, the Holy Spirit came upon all of them. And all of them could speak in tongues. But in the very next chapter, two of them decided to lie to the Holy Spirit. And when Peter spoke to them, they died. You know, Jesus told the 12 apostles, greater works than I've done, you will do. And the one I can find that for sure fits that picture is Ananias and Sapphira dying when Peter spoke to them. Jesus never caused anyone to die because he spoke to them, but Peter did. And that's the power of life and death. Now, my point about that is this is going on here. There's no doubt about that. That's in Scripture. Boy, when you get to reading what the Apostle Paul wrote, and by the way, the 12 apostles just sort of fade away out of the book of Acts until they're not there anymore. 
after Acts 15. The only indication that they are still gathering together is in Acts chapter 21 and 22 when Paul went and spoke to them. But Paul went and spoke to them to tell them that he was going to go out into the world and take Jesus Christ and his gospel out to the world where the Jews would never go. And that's people like you and me. So all of a sudden here, on this side of the cross, at the end of the book of Acts, Acts was here. At the end of the book of Acts, as the book of Acts was ending, from Acts chapter 9 when Paul was converted, to Acts chapter 11 when he spent a year in Antioch, then Acts chapter 13 when back in Antioch, the Holy Spirit separated him and Barnabas to go do the work that God called them to do. I finally got back to my subject here. They went out to do the work that God called them to do. And from then on, Paul was the dominant speaker, the prominent, prominent speaker, and the Lord visited him. The Lord Jesus Christ visited Paul um, in Acts 9, of course. Uh, and again, I think in Acts 14, you can account for that. And then uh, twice more after that, and once when he was on shipwreck, maybe that'd be five times total. I'm not sure, but it's something like that. In other words, it, it uh, Paul saw the Lord several times. Now, here in Ephesians chapter two, where I told you to go, there's a verse here that talks about us. Now, the us that I'm referring to is what fills up this time frame. Romans through Philemon. You know, I wish this was being transcribed, written down, because I've got somebody that's very interested in Bible study, but I can't seem to get the point across, being the subtle man that I am. I can't seem to get the point across that all of God's word is for us, but it's not all written to us. But if you look at Romans to Philemon, then you find us really well. Now, this time frame here of Paul writing, he started writing during the book of Acts. So I'm going to bring that back there like that. From the time of his salvation on, he was serving the Lord. In the process of writing down, not going where he, where he needed to go, but process of writing down what the Lord wanted him to write down, he wrote down Romans to Philemon. And as a subsequent, subsequent to that comes generation after generation after generation after century after century after century. Now we're into the third millennium since Christ was born, and we're getting close to since Christ died. This is 2024. If we just use our calendar straight, and we really shouldn't do that, but if we do it, then 2033 is going to be the 2000th. Uh, date after Christ died, was buried, rose again, and shortly after that is when he sent Paul to tell you and I how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised again the third day according to the scriptures. And when he was raised again the third day, according to the scriptures, he appeared unto Peter and the rest of the 12. After that, he, he appeared to more than 500 people. And then after that, the Bible says he appeared unto Paul last of all. Last of all, he appeared unto Paul. Now, my point is this. Where are we on this timeline? Where are we on this timeline? We're right there in the red part. We're right there in Romans to Philemon. We're right there in the time frame. When we get through looking at that, there is two periods of time over here. There is a seven-year period and a 1,000-year period. And then comes a new heaven and a new earth. And the whole thing starts with the completed work of God. God's work is complete. You and I have it because it's all written down for us to have. Do you realize that in all this time frame, all the way across here, all the dispensations that you can find, 
things that look like dispensations, things that mimic dispensations. Look how God deals with his creation anywhere. And when he changes the manner in which he does it, he has changed dispensational time. The matter, the manner of dispens dispensing is a dispensation. Now, here's the thing, folks. When all of that is done, it is to destroy the works of Satan. We have two passages of scripture that will show you that, Isaiah and 1 John. There's two passages. Look in 1 John, since you're close to it. Look in 1 John. Hold on to Ephesians 2, and 1 John will be after uh, first and second Peter, then first John. First John chapter three, sorry, I think I said two. The verse is verse eight, and he's talking about people who have been born of God. You understand being born of God? Jesus Christ is born of God and born again. Born again is not about getting saved. It's about being in your eternal home. Now look at verse 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. Now watch. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Well, the Son of God is manifested from Genesis chapter 3 all the way through the end of the Bible. When you get to these last nine books over here and you have Hebrews through Revelation, you have finished all the books. There are 66 books. Every book in your Bible is about how the Lord is destroying the works of the devil. That's his purpose. That's the purpose of God. Look back, if you will, in Isaiah 14. I, sh I didn't mean to do this, but we'll do it anyway. Go to Isaiah 14. And you don't have to work real hard on this passage to understand that it's Lucifer that we're talking about, and he shows up by name in Ezekiel. But notice this in Isaiah 14, verse, he shows up here, I'm sorry, verse 12. Isaiah writes, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, and this is, a, this is a biggie here, this is what caused Lucifer's departure from heaven, and it's what caused God to take back what is his. And he's doing it with a timeline that looks like this. Pardon my artwork. He says, verse 13, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened the, not the house of his prisoners. And he goes on, and he's putting, if you will, Lucifer in his place here. Notice if you, say, if you see this in verse um, 24. The Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass. And as I have purposed, so shall it stand that I will break the Assyrian in my land, and that's another word for the Antichrist. The another word, that's the, that's the last big enemy of God to show up. It's, he belongs to Satan. He's, he's Satan's man. He's Satan in the flesh and so forth. That I will break the Assyrian in my land and upon my mountains tread him underfoot. Then shall his yoke depart from off them and his burden depart from off their shoulders. This is the purpose that is purposed upon the whole earth. And this is the hand that is stretched out upon all the nations. For the Lord of hosts hath purposed, and who shall disannul it? And his hand is stretched out, and who shall turn it back? Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something. When God Almighty set this in order, he knew exactly how long it would take. 
You and I don't have any idea how long it'll take. We can see what has been, you know, roughly the 4,000 years. We can see what will be the almost exactly seven years followed by the 1,000 years. But what's in between us? We are. Now go back to Ephesians 2. I'm sorry. Go back to Ephesians and look, look in Ephesians 1 again. Verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we've obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Whoa. God's doing this the way he wanted to. He's doing this in order for the way his will comes about to be known. And he tells us all about how it's going to happen because we can look at the prophecy about this over here and see it. And all we have to do, all we, <laughs> all we have to do is to get through this time. All of this has passed, including the book of Acts. All of this has passed. The church called the body of Christ. I'm going to put that down here from, from right there under that arrow right there. This is the body of Christ forward. It's still going on to this day. The body of Christ is filling up the last dispensation of time so that in the fullness of the dispensation of times, this is full, this is full, this right here is full, this over here is in prophecy and will be full. This is the unknown. We are the unknown. We are the mystery. We are the mystery of his will. Now look in chapter 2. When he begins to explain to these Ephesians, they're like, they're like you and me. The Colossians and the Ephesians, they match us. They do. They were never under the covenant to Abraham. They never had a promise in Israel. And you know that by chapter 2, verse 12. Uh, we're not going to labor that tonight, but that's where it's at. We, don't, we never did belong to Israel. We still don't belong to Israel. Israel has a separate and chosen inheritance, all their own. Probably need to go there on another night. But look here in Ephesians chapter 2. He begins this segment after telling us about salvation. And let me just do that. We'll start reading in verse four. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us, God hath quickened us, together with Christ. When was Christ quickened? We're quickened together with Christ. When was Christ quickened? He was quickened when he was raised from the dead right there. Even when we were dead in sins, God hath quickened us together with Christ, parentheses, by grace you are saved. He's telling the Ephesians, likewise the Colossians, because they're just like them, and all the rest of us, he's telling us who are in the body of Christ, he's telling us, by grace you are saved. The word ye is plural. Ye, you, your, and yours are plural in your King James Bible. Thee, thou, thy, and thine are singular in your Bible, just as they were in 17th century English legalese, which the Bible, King James Bible, is written according to. Now, notice he says here, uh, by grace you're saved, and God, still talking about God's activity here, and God hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Well, if you paid attention to uh, the study on 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, verse all, all the verses, but especially 19 through 21, when we trust Christ as our Savior, we have the righteousness of God because we are at that time placed into Christ. And God made Christ to be sin for us. He knew no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In Christ, we are righteous. That's our condition. That's our state. It may not be our activity, 
but that and not state that's our standing that's who we are with God we are Christ's body church the body of Christ and by the way denominationalism will put the church the body of Christ in the Bible anywhere they want to well, they're wrong. It's only found in Romans to Philemon. It's only found written about by the Apostle Paul. And Peter said that what Apostle Paul wrote was hard to understand. Well, don't you know it was, is, to somebody who won't see a difference in it, it is hard to understand. So here's the thing. In Ephesians chapter 2, when he says, by grace you're saved, he says then that God has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, verse seven, here's the reason that in the ages to come, I don't know where they're at. I mean, sure, I could say the seven years is one of the ages to come. I could say the thousand years is one of the ages to come because they haven't occurred yet. I know they're going to, but I suspect that when there's that new heaven and new earth, which is also promised out here, I suspect that there are more ages. I don't suspect that Jesus Christ is going to be different. I don't suspect that the body of Christ is going to be different. I suspect that we are going to be showing somebody something because watch this verse unfold. Verse 7, Ephesians 2, 7, that in the ages to come, he, God, might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. That's us forever. Keep reading. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. That salvation is not of yourselves. The activity in there is being saved, and uh, and then not of yourselves. You don't do that. You can drop all the I did and I did and I want to and so on and so forth and just do this. I am a failure, and I must trust Christ for my salvation. I'm not worth a flip, but I'm going to trust Christ as my Savior. The night that I got saved, I gave up. I said, I'm a mess. Please save me. I was a mess. And I'd only spent 22 years doing it. Now look at this. He says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now watch verse 9. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For, here's the verse. Well, about 45 minutes ago, that's why I started to go right there. Verse 10. For we, saved people, we who are saved by grace through faith, we who have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ according to chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. And 14. Now here's the thing. For we are his workmanship. God's workmanship? God had an effect on my life? You better believe he did. He gave me eternal life in spite of what I am and who I am. And the bad things that I have done are probably not nearly as bad as I think about doing. Say, so, well, you're not fit for anything. You've got that exactly right. So well, God won't have anything to do with you. Nobody will have something to do with his son whose righteousness he put on me. Now think about that for yourself. You don't need to worry about old Jer. It won't make any difference. Think about it this way. We're his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now, when he goes on, he reminds these people where they started from. He says in verse 12 that at that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. You had no connection to the commonwealth of Israel. Strangers from the covenants of promise, not in on the law, not in on Abraham's promise, none of it. having no hope and without God in the world, verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you, we, us, he says, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Now, before get off on another subject, it takes another hour and a half here, and there's one there. Let's skip down a few verses and see what the culmination of this whole thing is. Remember, I was, twice I showed you two verses that said that the reason for God to be doing this is to destroy the works of Satan. Lucifer. Now notice verse uh, 19. After explaining why we are and who we are and how we got there in Christ, he says, now therefore you're no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow, fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. The household of God. 
Well, what do you think the household of God looks like? Well, I'll tell you this much. Everything that happened way back here in Genesis is called the foundations. Foundations. What do you build first in a house? Oh, you have a foundation. You build everything else to fit the foundation. Now notice this. Now, therefore, you're no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Well, why go way back here? I find prophets writing back here. I find prophets in, alive here. I find that all of these guys here from Isaiah to Malachi had um, many of them met with death because people didn't like them saying all the things they were saying, of course, but they were prophets of God. They said what God wanted them to say. When, uh, when uh, one of them, when he spoke up against a king and a chief priest in the northern ten tribes of Israel, um, a yes man for the king said, get out of here. Who do you think you are? You're, you're not, you, you don't have anything to say to the king. You're just, you're pronouncing things on him. You don't know nothing. And that prophet said, I was not a prophet. I was a keeper, a, a, a gatherer of sycamore fruit. I don't even know what that is. He said, but God said, go say it. And I went and said it. And by the way, when God gets done with you, there ain't going to be nobody left in your family that the earth will even remember was here. And that happened to that man. What was God doing there with that prophet? Amos. What was he doing with Amos when he made that, made Amos say those words and sure enough, the guy died and his family died and on and on and on it goes. What was he doing? He was protecting the integrity of his plan, of his work, and who was doing it and who was not doing it. And you see that repeatedly through all of this, all of this, and you can read all of that. It's wonderful to read it. And you can see God's plan unfolding to bring Jesus Christ here. And you can see Jesus Christ finishing his work. He turned to the, the Father in heaven in John 17 and said, I have finished the work you sent me to do. And you and I weren't even there. But he was talking about the work for all of this, to correct all of this. Jesus did it and brought forth a whole new priesthood which is going to be in place doing exactly what the Lord wants them to do when the time comes. Now, here's the other thing in Ephesians 2. This is a big house. This is a big house. Look at this. Verse 20. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together for an habitation of God, through the Spirit. Now, I can no more draw you a picture of this than uh, I could draw a picture of a, of a beautiful cat. You don't want me drawing pictures. But what I'm seeing here is that there's a building fitly framed together. And part of it is a holy temple in the Lord. And part of it we're living in. And part of it these other people live in. Well, wow. who are they? People who did the Lord's will. The Bible says, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. The Bible says something very dear to us, you and me, and the people that we know. We know a lot of people in this world who deny Jesus Christ. They deny that there's any need for a Savior. They deny that he would be one if there was a need for a Savior. They don't like him. They have some weird picture of him, and there's somebody who's been feeding them the wrong things about him, and so they don't know what to say about him, and so they say all the wrong things about him. They don't know who Jesus Christ was or what he did for them. But we do. Now notice here in 1 Timothy chapter 2, he says, verse 3, the last, last of the three lines of verse three says, God, our Savior. And then there's a pronoun there starting verse four with who. So that's God, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Well, I know where the truth is. It's right here. It's right here in this book. The truth is right here. Every bit of it. Jesus declared that to be also in John 17. He said to the Father, he said, thy word is truth. Thy word is true. 
Well, then, since his word is truth, we've got it written down here. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, he says, for there is, he says, God, our God, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved, verse 4, and to come unto the knowledge of the truth, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. There's no other mediators between God, the Father, and you. Man, mankind. And that's the man, Christ Jesus. When I pray, I pray to the Father through Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. When I pray, I ask the Father for his will, that I might not bend his will, that I might not take some, beg something out of his will, straighten out the, the idiocy of my prayer and give me exactly what is in your will. God will have all men to be saved and somebody has got to preach the gospel to them, tell them how that Christ died for their sins, was buried, was raised again the third day. If they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved, not stand up, sit down, sign a card, do a dozen things. It's God that works in you to do things. And if you're lost, you don't have God. If you've never trusted Christ as your savior, God is not your friend. God doesn't know you. So, well, I know him, I've been reading about him. Well, that's good. But if you want him to be what he's supposed to be to you and you to be what you're supposed to be to him, then to be saved, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. That's the key. The key to understanding dispensation, the key to understanding time frame, the key to understanding God's will all over the place for mankind is to trust Christ as your savior. Now, here's the thing. We have a work to do. Notice, if you will, Philippians chapter four, I think it is. Yes, Philippians four. He tells you how to pray and he tells you what to, how to end your prayer. Now, I don't mean stopping praying and like you've finished it. I'm pretty sure I've never finished a prayer thinking that's the only prayer I should make. Don't know, but I'm pretty sure I don't believe I'm done praying. Notice he says in verse six, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You know, that moment when I trusted Christ as my savior, there was an absence of any problems. There's no guilt. It was gone. What happened to it? He took it away. Why did he take it away? Because Christ died for those sins. And the things I've done since, which are probably worse than some I've done up to that time, he died for them too. Christ died for all of our sins. Christ paid the ultimate price for the ultimate pack of sins. Christ died for all our sins. Not only that, he says in Colossians chapter 2 that God has forgiven us all trespasses. God reconciled himself to us long before we ever thought about God. Paul said, we pray you, and Christ said, be ye reconciled to God. How do you get reconciled to God? You trust his son. You trust what Jesus Christ did for you. You trust that fact that all the sins were paid for. You trust that fact that God isn't trying to beg you into a certain position to get you saved. He says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's in your Bible. Now notice he says here in, in Philippians chapter four, he says in verse eight, Finally, brethren, in other words, after you see the prayer, after you put forth the prayer, and he's talked about some arguments that went on in Philippi and how to solve them and so forth. And then he tells them how to pray. And then he says, finally, finally, brethren, verse eight, whatsoever things are true, that would be the word of God. Whatsoever things are honest, that would be the God, what God calls you unto. Whatsoever things are just, just means balanced, no evil, no over good, just balanced. That's what just is. Just is balanced. Whatsoever things are pure, 
Well, the only thing pure you can put your hand on is the word of God. The only thing pure you can see is the finished work of Christ. Whatsoever things are lovely. Hmm. Everything about the promise of God for our lives now and for eternity is lovely. Lovely. Then he says, whatsoever things are of good report, who would argue with the will of God? The will of God is as we've spoken, and it's and it has a it has a it had a starting point and it's got a completion. This timeline that we refer to as the Bible being a timeline going from Genesis to Revelation, that timeline, when it is finished. We won't have any need for time in the same sense that we do now. I'm not sure what eternity is going to be like, but I know that it is never ending. Eternal, never had a start, never has an ending. Everlasting life goes from the day we trust Christ as our Savior right into eternity, and we never have an end to it. I like that. Now notice here the next verse. He says, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Now, verse 9, those things which you both learned and received and heard and seen in me, that's Paul saying that, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Wow. Oh. The God of peace shall be with you if you follow the works that God has ordained you to do. And Paul, the man chosen to write Romans to Philemon in your Bible, Paul brought it to you. Now look back one chapter into chapter three and then I'll quit. My time is just about up. He says in verse um, 13 about the righteousness of God being manifested through him is what the completed statement's all about here. We'll start in verse 13. You go back and read the whole chapter, you'll see. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You have the high calling. If you think you don't, you look at a term called far above all heavens and there you'll find your eternal seat. You look at a term that says we are above all the principalities and powers and you'll see our position in Christ. High calling. We have the high calling. So Paul says, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, and that's got nothing to do with flesh, that's got everything to do with the doctrine as it's laid out. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me. I know people who think I follow Paul. You know what I tell them about that? Yes, I do. You know why? Because I got seven verses just like that or close to it that tell me to follow what Paul did. What Paul did was to show the church, the body of Christ, what they were to do in this life. That's why Romans to Philemon are 13 books, not 14 and not 12. He wrote 13 books, all 13 books, are an explanation of what we're supposed to be doing for the sake of Christ and his body while we're here on the earth. I don't care if it takes 3,000 years. I don't care if it takes one more day. The body of Christ will leave here when the Lord says, it's finished. Bring them up. And the Lord himself descends from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ rise first. Then we which are alive and remain are caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And that goes as high as you can go. 
It's who we are in Christ. And so he says here, Brethren, be followers together with me and mark them which walk so as you have us for an example. Verse 20, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. The work of the Lord you can find in Romans to Philemon. Always remember it's the Lord working in you, not you working for the Lord. Thank you for being here today. I hope the Bible class has been worthwhile. And Lord willing, we'll see you again on, on October the 13th in this. If I do anything else, I'll put it on Facebook and as many, tell as many people as possible. There's a possibility I might do one or two on this trip we're taking, but it doesn't look like it. So anyway, if not before, pray for us on the trip and we'll see you on October the 13th. Bye, everybody.